prosecution that they thought uh, with all that investigation they had figured something out. One thing you're going to see with all this dense foliage, it's a little thinner now than it was back then that runs along the side of uh, this house. There's a lot of berries. These berries from these Eugenia plants, uh, they were all over the floor of this uh, walkway. Once again, there was no blood going down here. You see the thickness of the uh, foliage here would have been pretty difficult to come over this, this, this wall, this fence. If you take a good look at this fence also, you'll see that it's sort of tied off at the top. Uh, and it's pretty sharp here at the top. And you would think that anyone who was trying to come over this uh, fence could have had some problems with uh, hurting themselves on this wire. And of course, there was no uh, blood. You would imagine this person was covered in blood. There'd be some blood or some fibers or something there. Here we have this air conditioning unit, which we've heard a lot about. Uh, once again, when I was talking about that A&E two-hour special that I saw the other night on the trial, and Bill Curtis made a point there saying this was a unit that Cato Kalin heard three loud thumps from. Well, Cato Kalin at no time in this trial said that he heard three loud thumps from the air conditioning unit. Once again, that was one of Marsha Clark's theories. Uh, she said that. What Cato actually said, and he demonstrated when he was on the stand with the, with the table in front of him, that he heard three loud bumps, sort of like that. Now, I don't know what that could have been. Maybe it was a signal. I have no idea. But he never said that he heard anyone hit this air conditioning unit. That was a theory of Marsha Clark's. Now, let's take a good look at this air conditioning unit. You can see there's some slats here. They face outward. It's head high. So one would think if anyone ran back here in the dark and ran into this uh, unit that they would should, should have sustained some type of bruise, some type of injury. And of course, if they were bloodied and had blood on them, uh, there should have been some fabric or some blood on that unit. Right down here, about four or five feet from this unit is where they found or where they claim to have found uh, the glove. Uh, one very interesting thing about that glove, there was no debris on it. There was a lot more here then than there is now. And one key thing about that glove, when Furman saw it, he said it was still wet. It was thick. We did some experiments with that with experts, and they all told you that there was no possible way, seven hours later after this crime, that that glove could still have, bloody, uh, have blood on it, could still be wet and still be bloody. That was, I think, an experiment that... I can't recall now if we really got it into evidence or not, but uh, we know, and the public should know, that that was an experiment that was done, and it proved that that glove should have been dried uh, by that time in the morning. Now, let's go around front again, and I'll show you some more interesting things. One other point I should say, once again, these berries that were here were also at Nicole's house. If someone walked out of that or walked away to the side of her house, and if they went uh, into that Bronco, there should have been some debris, some leaves, some berries. The same should uh, have been detected in my home. I have some very light carpeting, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, if someone ran through here and then went right into my house and went up that carpeting, stepping on these berries, one would think there'd be some trace of that on this very light carpeting. Let's go around front. Mm -hmm. Before we go into my uh, foyer and talk about more of the uh, so-called blood evidence, uh, uh, since we're out here, let me cover a few things that sort of came into the, the trial that there was a little car sarcasm about me hitting golf balls. Uh, uh, shortly after I got home, I would say uh, 10 o'clock, a little after 10 o'clock, I came out here. I was actually looking for a sand wedge. I had recently got some new clubs. Uh, Callaway Big Bertha irons, and I didn't like their sand wedge, and I wanted to go back to my old Callaway sand wedge. I also wanted to change my three wood. I'd gone into my garage, and I'd gotten an old three wood, a Wood Brothers, a sort of a custom-made club, even though the head was kind of beat up. I walked out here to my Bentley. I opened the trunk up where I had a lot of golf clubs, which the police had confiscated at some later time, and I couldn't find my sand wedge, and I took a pitching iron. I was uh, looking for some balls. I play with a ball called Max Fly 100. I had no new Max Fly balls, even though I have a closet full of other balls that I'd never used. But I did have a couple of bags of balls in the trunk of my car, balls that I had already used. Normally, I play two sleeves of balls per round of golf. So some of the balls that I would throw away, uh, other people uh, would think were great golf balls. I went through that bag and uh, tried to pick some unscuffed balls. I picked about five or six unscuffed balls. I put them in a little bag that I had in the trunk of my car that had a, a windbreaker in it, a Hertz windbreaker in it. I put those balls in that bag. I took 
the uh, pitching wedge and I took about four or five other balls and I walked over here, I dropped the bag right around here, a bag incidentally we brought into the courtroom, but since Alan Park claimed he never saw that uh, bag and couldn't identify it, uh, Judge Ito wouldn't allow us to put it into evidence. But anyway, I brought four or five balls, scuff balls, drop them here. Normally I have a net here that my son uh, Justin will hit balls into and I do a lot of chipping around here. And I began to chip those five or six balls away. Uh, I chipped a couple of them over into the sand and I actually chipped, uh, hit a full hit and hit one over this tree onto Mrs. Neverker's property which is across Ashford. Uh, curiously enough, the police found some golf balls the next uh, day. You never saw that in evidence, though, but I saw it in one of their discovery property reports. They found some of those golf balls. I actually sculled one, hit some of the playground equipment, and I had recently gotten all the dents out of my car. I was cringing trying to figure out where that ball uh, had gone. At that point, I walked back to my uh, Bentley. I put the club back in my Bentley. I actually left both the white bag as well as the other bag down here. No one ever mentions that white bag. We'll get to that a little uh, later. And I then walked out and looked into my back of my uh, uh, Bronco to see if I had any clubs there and my dog was out. We ended up walking back into my uh, Ashford gate because I normally keep one of the gates uh, on a hinge and then I went into the house. Now, hitting golf balls took all of two minutes, all of about two minutes at the most. And I may have been outside uh, between trying to find the club in the trunk of my car, being in my uh, garage, picking balls that were unscuffed, uh, coming over here, hitting golf balls, looking into my Bronco and walking back into my house, no more than 10 minutes that whole period of time. And at the same time, he said almost simultaneously, he saw a person approximately six feet tall, 200 pounds, African-American wearing all dark clothing, walking at a good pace up the driveway. Now at the same time that you saw Cato Kalin in the side yard, did you see anything else? Yes, I saw a, uh, a figure come down, well not come down, but I saw a figure come into the uh, entranceway of the house, just about where the, where the driveway starts. Can you show us on this uh, diagram where you first saw that person? Uh, just if you go where the circle is, you go straight back, no the other way, a uh, little bit farther, it was about there. Around that area. As I walked down my driveway, as you can see, it's easy to see me. Alan Park testified on the stand that he had a, a view from the end of my garage right up here, actually to the front of my house. And this is, uh, I guess, represents some of the uh, biggest frustration I had not only during the trial, but after the trial when Marsha Clark tried to create some impressions that. Fortunately, the jury didn't buy it. Unfortunately, the pundits bought it. They sold it to you and a lot of people out there. I see in interviews that we do on Man on the Street, they ask this question. You notice that Ross Becker asked me, who's the shadowy figure that came across the driveway? Bill Curtis, who did a very fine two hours on A&E, even felt, uh, I asked a question at one point about a shadowy figure coming down the driveway or across the lawn and entered the house. One guy even said, who was the guy Alan Park saw climb the wall? The facts are nobody, at no time I should say, did Allen Park uh, indicate that he saw anybody climb the wall, come down a driveway, cross a lawn, or even come across uh, the uh, driveway. That was a figment of Marsha Clark's uh, in her mind, and she tried to sell that to you, and unfortunately a lot of you people uh, bought that. What Allen Park testified to, that there was a person that was right about here. He put an X on an exhibit to prove it. Right here was where my golf bags were placed, where I walked out of my house put my suit bag down, looked into my golf bag. When he was let into my property by Cato Kalin and they arrived here, right here was a suit bag, which Alan Park thought was a duffel bag, 
as we know now, it was a suit bag. Uh, later on, you saw me on the plane and got off the plane with it. And my golf bag. That's all he saw. In the, in the time he arrived here was 10.20. I guess he was here until after 11 o'clock. That is the only activity outside of my house that he witnessed. Now let's go inside. 